I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to re-read these books. Oh, crap for this. Um, All right, let's get started. Let's get started. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's so good to be here. For those of you who don't know me, welcome to TPF. My name is Greg Sindelar. I have the great privilege of leading this organization. Um, and it's great to see so many friends here. Um, I would be remiss, though, somebody who loves job security, that we do have two board members here tonight. And that is, of course, Don Bennett and Stacy Hawk. So thank you guys for being here. Well, we appreciate everyone taking time out of their evening and their, their summer to join us uh, here and to have Vivek um, talk about his book. If you haven't read it, it's, it's, it's fantastic. I highly recommend it. Um, but it's about how stakeholder capitalism is destroying human flourishing across this country. You know, being woke isn't just about being polite or courteous. Oftentimes we think about like, oh, well, what pronouns should, should we use or what, what kind of descriptor should we use, right? But it, what is really at the heart of this, right, is a soft fascism that looks to control us and suppress opposition to its worldview, right? It's meant to control what we say, what we think, and what we do. And most of all, it's meant to control who we are. Your compliance and what you do leads unavoidably to the erasure of everything that you are. And this is the point. A person who can be made to affirm anything, no matter how preposterous, things like men can have babies, um, are that the American founding was actually in 1619, not in 1776, is no longer a citizen, right? Like we, we are subjects and subjects are actually fit to be ruled. And that is actually the ultimate goal. We see this disease increasingly in all walks of life, finance, science. I was just reading something the other day that they're mad at anthropologists for gendering uh, long, long gone uh, mummies and things like that. And of course, business. This threat not is not only to our way of life, but to our very freedom. And that is why we are here today. So before we bring up Vivek, uh, we want to bring a special guest. Um, and that's someone who's actually on the front lines here in Texas, fighting this fight and fighting for the soul of our state. So it's my great pleasure to have Comptroller Glenn Hager, who's fought successfully during his time in office to reduce not only administrative bloat, agency taxes, and has been promoting a healthier and prosperous Texas. Um, he's also most importantly at the forefront of this battle, ensuring that those woke funds don't divest from Texas and don't divest from our important industries. And he's also a sixth generation Texan. And as I told him, my favorite bio note, he's a fighting Texas Aggie. So <laughs> help me welcome Comptroller Glenn Hager. Thank you. I appreciate it. Got that on. All right. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, those of you that may not know, my grandfather, my mom said I was a Baptist preacher, so I cannot stand behind a podium. I have to be in front of the crowd moving around. My kids laugh because my hands move when I talk. They're like, what is it about your hands and talking? I'm like the two go hand in hand. That brings people together and gets them into what you're talking about. So it's good to be here. Good to see everybody. It's great to be uh, indoors on a good Texas hot day. Uh, earlier today, we had the opportunity of Vic Nye. He gave me his book. I, didn't, I wasn't able to read the whole book between earlier today and lunch and this 
this afternoon. So I got started. So Bud, thanks for putting us together. We had a great discussion over lunch, have a lot of things in common. As, as you uh, heard earlier, and most of you know, we're kind of at the forefront of this discussion and issue. And, and we were talking a lot of different discussions and different angles of how we talk about these issues. And as somebody who grew up on a family farm, I always like to remind people that we have three things in common. And what's one of those things? We eat food. And as we look around the world today, we talk about energy, we talk about moving people, you know, the whole lot of discussion is about electric vehicles and transitioning to this green society. And I make the point of that kid growing up on that family farm is that there's no better steward than my family and others that we want to have an environment that we can live in and our families can continue to prosper and thrive. And one of the points here that is very frustrating to me extremely frustrating. We talked about this at lunch today. There's a disconnect. And one of those disconnects that I have told people over and over again is that if you want to drive an electric vehicle, that's your choice. That's your choice. That's your dollars. You can spend it how you want to. But when you get in the car and you sit down, what are you sitting on? Something that's made out of petroleum products. When you touch a door to close a door, what are you touching? Something that's made out of petroleum product. You're touching a steering wheel. It's made out of petroleum product. If you touch the foot pedal of the gas, oh, by the way, the bottom of your shoes that you're wearing are made out of petroleum product. And the point is this, it's amazing to me that how many people are disconnected to understand. And we are realizing that more and more, I think, as people around the world, is that when you see an unfortunate Russian invasion of Ukraine, when you have Germany, where my family came from many generations ago, talk about they are going to this green society, but oh, the way, the way, we just don't tell you, we import all of our gas that keeps your homes warm from where? Russia and its natural gas. Or now firing back up seven coal plants because by the way, we don't have energy security as a country because we've been dependent on somebody else. And part of all this discussion, my frustration is in the point, whether it's the ag sector where we all eat those three meals a day, why? Because how does that food get to your table? How does that food get to your restaurant? No, it's not just in a truck. It's how it got produced. It's the fertilizer that's from natural gas. There's all this connectivity that people are not appreciating or understanding. And so one of my goals, one of my efforts is not just to identify in the legislation that I've been told, what are those entities that are so-called boycotting the fossil fuel industry, identifying those. And as I told my staff last year, as we were working on this, I said, part of this is somewhat of a big lie because you have companies that want to come quietly into my office and say, oh, by the way, don't pay attention to our publications. Our publications say one thing, but this is how much our portfolio is. We're investing in the natural gas, the oil industry. We're investing in energy in Texas. They go, but that's not what you're saying. So the problem is it's time to pull the veil back to show what are the parts that are the big lie? What are the parts that people understand there's connectivity? And what are the agenda and the issues that really are endangering really our national security, our ability to feed ourselves, and to understand where the world really is going to go in the future years? And so that's why I'm excited we had the opportunity to visit a little bit. You know, we're taking it from a little bit different angle and how we're communicating to people and how we're making, but the message is still the same. There is some very disturbing trends and patterns that have been going on in this country, in this world for a very long time. And I think, unfortunately, the events in the globe of the last year plus are showing how insecure that is making the world and how vital it is that we continue to have a very diversified energy portfolio. And that includes investing in fossil fuels in Texas and around the world. So it's good to be here. I look forward to hearing the discussion today. And thanks for letting me be here part of the time. All right, thank you, Comptroller Hager. That was fantastic. I think that was a good way to really frame uh, today's conversation. Um, so I would like to get straight to Vivek because he actually has more energy than anyone I think I've ever met. Um, I heard he was out hustling people on the tennis court earlier today. Um, but first I'll do a real quick introduction. So Vivek, if you haven't met him, he is a first generation entrepreneur, investor, and author, grew up in Ohio. 
I read uh, that he attended law school in sixth grade with his dad, and that's really where his political awakening came from. Uh, that was furthered when he went to Harvard, where he rebelled by be becoming a conservative, and I, I assume that that continued when he went to law school at Yale. Uh, but after school, he founded a pharmaceutical company, uh, which he recently stepped down from as, as CEO, and, uh, uh, but it's still their chairman to write this great book, Woke Inc. I'll keep uh, propping it up all day today. But uh, he's also started Strive Asset Management, which has such a simple mission that I just love, that's to get companies to focus on excellence, not politics. And he also has a book coming out in a few months. I already told him that we'll have him back here in a few months to talk about that. And that's a book called Nation of Victims, Identity Politics, The Death of Merit, and the Path Back to Excellence. So Vivek, we're looking forward to having you already back for that. But in the meantime, love to have you come join us on stage. Thank you. Thank you. I actually uh, played with, I think, a couple of the folks who we played with earlier today are, are in the uh, in the audience, and so it was actually humbling in Texas heat. It's not like playing indoors in uh, in Ohio. Uh, I, I see a couple familiar faces. I don't know most of you, but I, I was born and raised in Ohio. That's right. Uh, we live there today. That is actually where the new company is based, is in Columbus, Ohio. And I frequently asked my dad when he came over. So he was an immigrant. He came over in the late 70s when we were growing up why on earth did you come halfway around the world from Southern India to Cincinnati, Ohio? And he said it was because his older sister lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and that was the place he could find a job at GE that was closest to where she worked. That, of course, begged the question of why she came halfway around the world to Fort Wayne, Indiana. And, and the best answer we ever got was it is the only U.S. state with the word India contained in the, in the name of the state. So... That's a story of how we highlighted in Ohio, uh, but nonetheless, we, uh, we ended up sticking around and by way of a 13-year detour to New York City, settled back there for the, for the new company, which in the q and I'd actually love to tell you a little bit more about my journey. We, we heard from Comptroller Hagar. I think that the problems that we're going to talk a little bit about over the next 45 minutes are, are complex problems that do not lend themselves to a single silver bullet of an answer. These are problems that originate at the intersection of... I think misused state power and, and potentially misused corporate power that together have created new 21st century challenges that don't lend themselves to the 1980 even conservative vision of, of governmental overreach. And I think it's going to take a multi-pronged effort, both between brave state actors like Comptroller Hager, who has led the way nationally, have been impressed by and want to recognize, but also by actors in the market itself. And, and I think that that's a big part of where I hope we end our conversation about viewing solutions, not just through lawmaking, even though we're at a public policy institute, we live in a moment where I think many of the solutions that policymakers may address may be just as well addressed through our culture and through the market itself. Before we get there, I'll, I'll lay out the premise of the book. Uh, and, you know, I brought as many copies as we could, you know, just to give away, uh, you know, so I think I have 20 copies or so whoever wants to take one feel free uh, on the way out. Goal is not to you know, sell books, but I do hope to spread its message. Um, you know, I, th I think I'll talk a little bit about the problem first and then end, I promise, on a more optimistic note about paths forwards and solutions. But, but I'll start on an optimistic note as well. Taking you back to the moment that I was in second grade when I first heard Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. You all know that one well. It was a speech where he famously said that I hope that my four children grow up in a country where they are judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. I'll tell you, that dream, it, it stuck with me. It meant something to me because it actually was the dream that allowed my dad to come over to this country from halfway around the world 45 plus years ago and build a successful career for himself at the GE plant in Evendale, Ohio despite the fact that he had a thick Indian accent. He still does to this day. It was the dream that allowed me to go. Thank you for that flattering introduction, but less about me, more about the dream of this country that allowed me to go in a single generation from being the kid of Indian immigrants who came to this country with almost no money to becoming the founder of a multi-billion dollar biotech company that got drugs approved for patients who needed them. One of the drugs I had a privilege of working on was a drug for prostate cancer. It's an FDA approved product today. It's probably the one I'm personally most proud of actually. But I stepped down from 
that role to work on a different kind of cancer. It's not a biological cancer. It's a sort of cultural cancer, though, that I worried threatened the very dream that allowed me to achieve everything I ever had in my career. And it was a new kind of cancer, not in our government, but in our culture. And one of the things they teach you in medicine and in biology is that in order to understand a cancer, you have to first look at the root causes of that cancer. I went through that exercise in the book a little bit, tracing the root causes of the cancer that I was addressing. And one of the conclusions I came to was that this cancer was born not in 21st century America, but actually in 20th century Europe. When you look at the most toxic philosophies of the 20th century, in my opinion, they were undoubtedly German Nazism, which was identity politics on steroids, combined with Soviet Marxism, which was an oppressor, oppressed narrative on steroids. You combine the two, that's when you get its modern love child on American soil, the namesake of my book, Modern Wokeism here in the United States. And, and the thing that bothered me about this first, and it led to some unexpected places, all the way to what even impacts the energy industry, and I'll come back to that later. But the first place that it bothered me was its vision of human identity. The idea that your identity as a human being is centered on your genetically inherited attributes, like your race, your gender, and your sexual orientation, full stop. If you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged. If you're white, you're inherently privileged, no matter your economic background or your upbringing. Characteristics like your race and gender and sexual orientation determine who you are and what you can achieve. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of not putting words in anyone else's mouth, creating straw man arguments. I don't think that we move our discourse along that way. But I think it is important to take a movement on its own terms. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, a member of the squad in Congress, famously said a couple of years ago, we don't want any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice. We don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. I'm sure I don't fit her description of what counts as a brown voice. But I think it's worth examining what's at the heart of this philosophy. The idea that your race is not just about your skin color, but about the content of the ideas you're allowed to have is part of the philosophy that leads us to a culture of speech repression, because any disagreement with that voice, with that viewpoint, is automatically then labeled racist. You can fill in your name of choice, homophobic, transphobic, denier, whatever the, whatever the label of choice may be, that label automatically attaches. And there is no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist. And some of the other names certainly make the top five. Denier is quickly climbing that list, climate change denier I'm referring to. And so that's created this new culture of fear where our culture of free speech and open debate has been replaced by this new culture of fear where everyday Americans are choosing to bend the knee. And one of the things I worry about is that that culture has actually proven to be a great threat to American democracy. If, if you ask me the best measure of the health of any democracy, especially American democracy, is the percentage of people who feel free to say what they actually think in public. And I have no doubt that we are doing abysmally on that metric. I can't remember a time in my life where there was, with the exception of maybe last year, where there was a bigger gap between what people were willing to say in public and what we were, people were willing to say in private. Maybe it's a little bit better this year than it was last year, but last two years, can't remember a worse time in my life where that gap was wider. And I think that's an indictment of the health of a democracy. It's not the number of ballots that are cast every November. It's not the percentage of people who vote. Those things are important. But that's just fetishizing the final act at the end of the process. The thing that really matters is whether you actually feel free to speak in public, whether we settle our differences of opinion on the most important social and political questions through free speech and open debate in the public square as citizens, rather than to settle those questions through force, which was the Nazi way, which was the Soviet way, but which appears to be the modern economic mechanism of force that's used to settle those political questions of how to combat historical racism or social injustice or climate change, settling those questions through economic force rather than through the mechanism that we created in a democracy to settle those questions through free speech and open debate. So, so one of the questions that interested me is, how did we get here? What was the genesis of the birth of this, this problem? It, you know, it took a book to explore. There's no one 
single narrative. I think that there are some generational factors at work here that probably exceed the scope of our discussion. We could touch on them and go into them in the Q&A. Uh, we are in the middle of the largest intergenerational wealth transfer in human history. I think that that creates a lot of, a lot of cultural issues in the generation that's on the receiving end of that wealth transfer. I personally am not on the receiving end of that wealth transfer. I'm, I'm, I feel fortunate, unshackled by, by, I think, the psychological baggage that comes with being on the receiving end of that wealth transfer. But we're in the largest intergenerational wealth transfer in human history. Ludwig von Mises, famous Austrian economist about a century ago, famously wrote that there's actually two ways to, uh, to exceed your father if he's a great man. One is on his own terms, which by definition is very hard to do if your father's a great man. The second is through moral superiority, which is actually much far easier to achieve because morality is subjectively defined by the self. You know, that writ large on a modern generational scale, I think, leads to a lot of those cultural circumstances that led to the cultural problem we're talking about. I'm not going to touch on those, but one of the untold stories that does interest me was the 2008 financial crisis. This one sticks out in my mind because I actually got my first job at a hedge fund in New York City in the fall of 2007 on the eve of the 08 financial crisis. It was a pretty interesting time to get a job. I'm actually in the asset management business again, now a decade and a half later, by way of a decade and a half detour in biotech. But I got my first job in asset management back where I am today at that hedge fund. And, and you know, there was a lot of learnings, but one of the learnings was watching it with the front row seat. But what happened in the back of the 08 crisis was that Wall Street went from being, you know, possibly the, the hero figures of where wealth was created, greed is good works, to becoming the bad guys. And the really bad guys on the back of receiving government bailouts, which by the way, I opposed and, and to this day continue to oppose. I think we are paying back a lot of the sins created by those 2008 bailouts. But put that to one side, Wall Street was then the bad guy. And what the old left wanted to do, agree or not, was to show up in the form of the Occupy Wall Street movement and say, we want to redistribute money from those wealthy corporate fat cats and give it to poor people to help poor people. Agree or not, that was, that was the core call. But there was also the birth of this new identitarian wing of the left. It was, it was a really fringe wing at the time, but that said that, you know what, the real problem, you know, it wasn't quite economic injustice. It wasn't quite poverty. It was racial injustice and misogyny and bigotry and maybe even the beginnings of the inconvenient truth of climate change. These are the real injustices, not, not the old stuff like economic injustice or poverty. And I think that actually is what presented the opportunity of a generation for Wall Street in this country, big business in this country, for some leaders in the asset management industry who seized on that and pounced on it on the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, where what they realized is that this new wing of the progressive movement was actually pretty easy to deal with. Applaud diversity and inclusion. Put some token minorities on your boards. Muse about the racially disparate impact of climate change after you fly in a private jet to Davos. This is a Pretty good, pretty good work if you can get it. We'll talk about systemic racism all you want. Don't talk about systemic financial risk, and we'll call it a day. And it's sort of the story I you know, cynically write about in the book about you know, a bunch of neo-progressive millennials get in bed with a, with a bunch of big banks. Together, they birth woke capitalism, call it ESG, and then put Occupy Wall Street up for adoption. That's basically what happened over the last decade and a half. <laughs> you know, they're really good at labeling it with three letter acronyms. It was socially responsible investing. That was SRI, corporate social responsibility, you know, CSR, ESG. You pick your, you know, ESG, SRI, CSR, CCP, you know, <laughs> pick your favorite three letter acronym of choice. It, it doesn't matter. It's the same agenda that, that I think in some ways got propagated. I'll come back to China and their role in this in a second. But, but that was how the game was played. It works, I think, well enough for Wall Street that Silicon Valley got in on the act. What Silicon Valley realized was that actually the old threat to monopoly power, to skepticism of the corporate concentration of power, a skepticism that I will be the first person to proudly admit that I share, that was a liberal concern. That is a classically pre-Citizens United, pre-2010 liberal concern. And, and, and what Silicon Valley realized is that they were potentially a target of that movement on the left. And so they brokered the same deal. They said that, all right, look, We'll agree to advance your vision of the good, your vision of the better society, using our power to do it, in part through taking down hate speech and misinformation as defined by the opposition. We'll agree to broker that truce, 
but we don't do it for free. We effectively expect that the new version of your movement look the other way when it comes to leaving our corporate power intact. And that's how the game was played. I mean, my, my parents had an arranged marriage. It's one that actually worked out really well. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually sympathetic to the case for, for an arranged marriage. This was an arranged marriage too, but this is not an arranged marriage of love. It was more like mutual prostitution. And the net result was the birth of this new Leviathan in modern American life that was far more powerful than what Thomas Hobbes envisioned 400 years ago, far more powerful than what our founding fathers envisioned 250 years ago. And it was a new force that was a hybrid of effectively big government and big business that was far more powerful than either one alone because together it could do what neither one couldn't on its own. And I think that this then became part of a pattern that the rest of corporate America could then copy. You know, Wall Street paved the way, the ESG, you know, linked financial institutions and asset managers, you know, many of whom have, I think, have taken this dogma and built multi-trillion dollar businesses on the back of it. You know, Silicon Valley benefited from its version of it. The rest of corporate America then jumps on the train. You know, Coca-Cola musing about a voting law in Georgia that makes it sound more like a super PAC than a soft drink manufacturer, teaching its employees how to be less white, their words, not mine, without saying a peep about their own product's impact on the nationwide epidemic of diabetes and obesity, including in the black community that they profess to care so much about. Nike, repeatedly criticizing slavery 200 years ago in the United States, without doing a thing about reducing its own reliance on slave labor today, all the while sourcing $250 sneakers that they sell to those black kids in the inner city who can't afford to buy books for school. So this is a repeated game played over and over again. And, and I've, I've referred to China a couple of times. I think it's worth talking about the geopolitical implications of this marriage, this arranged marriage. It's not an arranged marriage of two. It's more like a, you know, excuse the crass reference, more like a threesome, okay? There's China has gotten in on the act because what they've recognized is this is a generational opportunity to erode America's greatest geopolitical asset of all. And here's a hint, that is not our nuclear arsenal. It is our moral standing on the global stage. If you have any doubt about this, listen really carefully to what Xi Jinping says every time he is pressed on the Uyghur human rights crisis. First thing he says is that Black Lives Matter shows the United States is no better, at least according to his translator, that's what he says. His top diplomat came to the Alaska summit last year. This is not an accident. Lectures Anthony Blinken for 15 minutes in his opening statement. Anthony Blinken, you know, he couldn't blink. He was stunned <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the, let's just say, demand that the United, his words, not mine, okay, that the United States stop slaughtering Black Americans and that China wants to see the U.S. do better on human rights. This would be laughable if it weren't for the fact that our own corporations, multinational corporations, lend implicit moral credibility to his claims by relentlessly criticizing those injustices and apologizing for them here in the United States without saying a peep about actual atrocities in China, embracing the new apologist demands of the ESG movement propagated by the world's largest financial institutions through a trickle-down effect that permeates every industry without actually applying those same standards halfway around the world to places like China. And, and so, I mean, just give you a particular example. It's been in the news in the United States recently. Take Disney, right? I'm not going to belabor what Disney did this year. You all are you know, presumably familiar with Disney's campaign. This year, a few years ago, Disney had a similar spat with the state of Georgia for passing an anti-abortion statute, said they couldn't shoot films there. That's Disney in the United States. Last year goes to literally ground zero of that Uyghur human rights crisis. There's a million religious minorities in concentration camps subject to forced sterilization, communist indoctrination, and worse. Films Milan finally musters up the courage to speak up at the end of the film, where you can see in the movie today, in the credits, it says that we thank the local authorities for allowing us the privilege of, of filming here. That's what Disney had to say. Nike, same story. NBA, same story. BlackRock, same story. Airbnb, same story. Airbnb, great reporting by the Wall Street Journal, actually, about a year and a half ago. As a condition for doing business in China, has to turn over the data of US customers, its users, the private messages like emails that go between hosts and, and, and renters on Airbnb are turned over, including the geolocational data to the Chinese government. I'm not saying that that's worth a lot, but that was a condition for doing business in China. 
in a way that makes it really convenient to post a neat little black square on your Instagram account and declare a commitment to a net zero pledge by 2050, when in fact you're subsidizing, I think, a, a, a truly, a truly repressive regime that you say nothing about and create that false moral equivalence. And so in the q and I'm happy to take more questions about this. I have detailed views about how this is really the product of bad policy from both sides of the aisle, Republicans and Democrats through the 1990s who embraced this philosophy of democratic capitalism, thinking that we could use capitalism as a vehicle to spread democracy to places like China, thinking that we could use our investment abroad to get nations like China to behave more like the United States, when what ended up happening was that nations like China realized that they could actually use their money, access to their market, to get us to be more like them, rather than the other way around, or even better, use our money to get us to be more like them. And I think that that has played out where we sent Big Macs and Happy Meals thinking that was going to spread democracy. They spent back Nike sneakers and Disney movies, and, and maybe some ESG-linked funds by fund managers that do business in both places as Trojan horses to undermine the interests of the United States from within. And I think that that's a that, that, that's, a, that's a real aspect to the story that isn't a conspiracy theory. I think it's a conspiracy reality that China has woken up to, has become alert to, has themselves awakened to in a way that we Americans here have not. And I think it's a really important dimension where even if you think about the role of corporations or large financial institutions or asset managers, today, managing funds on both sides of the Pacific Serving as the prosecution and the defendant, the, the advocate for the prosecution and the defendant in the same case, it doesn't work. I think that at the end of the day, there's going to be a necessary, at least bifurcation of the market on both sides of the Pacific in a way that is unavoidable so long as companies are actually co-opted as agents to advance not only an American political agenda, but perhaps even more problematically, a Chinese political agenda here in the United States. So happy to talk more about that in the Q&A as well. All that leads to you know, the, 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 the grim, you know, doom and gloom, dark stuff. I do think it's important to see the problem with clear eyes. The good news is I think there are ways, positive, unifying, transpartisan ways forward to address this set of problems. I think some of those can begin with public policy. I'll say in a moment why those are not the avenues that I'm principally focused on, but I think that you know, having taken the benefit of a year and a half to write a book, I didn't want to be shy about sharing some of the ideas that I think policymakers on both sides of the aisle can embrace to potentially deliver unifying solutions that need not fall into partisan camps to address the core of the, of the threat to free speech, the threat to democracy, the threat to the integrity of capitalism and democracy that I just laid out. One of those, I think, involves recognizing that the 1980s wisdom that animated the conservative movement in this country viewing all threats to liberty as coming from the government may be outdated. Actually, my favorite Republican of all time was not Ronald Reagan. Loved what he did 40 years ago for the country, but it wasn't Ronald Reagan. It was Abraham Lincoln, who 160 years ago famously said that the dogmas of a quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. And I think for many of us, the dogmas of 1980 are inadequate to address the unique problems of 2022. It's not 1980 anymore. It's like Dorothy might've said to Toto, we have to think of new solutions to address the unique threats to liberty as they present themselves today, unshackled by the orthodoxies of the color of the jersey that we wear. One of those orthodoxies relates to what we think of as the free market, okay? So I'm gonna pick one issue by way of example, but this is really just an example. It relates to online censorship by technology companies. Conventional wisdom would say that these are private actors free to decide what does and doesn't show up on their websites because they're private companies and this is the free market doing its work. I say I agree with that. That's 1980s wisdom and I agree with it if they're actually behaving as private companies. But if it turns out those private companies are working in conjunction with state actors like the federal government or state governments, or working at the behest of threats of the federal government, or at the behest of incentives provided by the federal government to do through the back door what the government could not directly do through the front door under the constitution, then actually that isn't the action of a private company. It's the action of a government actor disguised in the action of a private company. And so, you know, one of the principles that I think Democrats, Republicans, independents, people who care about 
the integrity of, of the constitutional principle set into motion in 1776 should agree on is that if it is state action in disguise, then the constitution still applies. And if companies are going to work hand in glove with the party in power, whoever that party is, to do through the back door what government can't do through the front door, then they ought to be bound by the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States if you're a technology company. I think it's no different. If you're an asset manager or a financial institution implementing not a Green New Deal through the front door, say what you will about the Green New Deal. Maybe it should be passed if that's what the politically accountable leaders of this country put through our constitutionally ordained process for lawmaking. That ought to be the law of the land if it goes through that process. But if it can't go through that process, what we can't do is live in a society that then implements that same agenda through the disguise of a climate pledge or a net zero pledge or an ESG linked asset management agenda, financial agenda that implements the same agenda through the back door that the political process could not address through the front door, including through financial incentives to be able to do so provided by the state itself. So look, if it's state action, let's smoke it out. We might have disagreements, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, let's debate out in the open, pass the laws through the constitutionally ordained process, through the political process, and live with the results. That's part of what it means to live in a democratic society, not to live in a monarchical society where it gets settled through the back door through the use of force instead. And it's not just limited to the internet. It's not just limited to you know, even ab abstract industries like the financial services industry or the investment industry. I think we see it in the workplace today too. The idea that many employees have been fired for saying the wrong thing at work or not even at work, but on their own time, attending the, law, the wrong political function, wearing the hat of the wrong presidential candidate, posting the wrong viewpoint on social media and getting fired for it, I think it sometimes betrays our understanding of what it, my understanding certainly, of what it means to be an American. I think part of what it means to be an American is that we don't choose between exercising our First Amendment rights and speaking freely and pursuing the American dream by putting food on the dinner table. We're a country where you get to enjoy both of those things at once. We're the quintessential country where you get to enjoy both of those things at once. Now here too, conventional 1980s style wisdom would say that actually the free market should solve this problem. Because if there's all these businesses firing people for silly political reasons over here, it should create an occasion for other businesses to hire those same great employees and the market should be able to work this out. I think it's a reasonable point of view. The only problem is we have to apply that standard even handedly. We cannot blindly trust the market to police viewpoint-based discrimination while not trusting the market at all to police discrimination on the base of race, sex, sexual orientation, religion, national origin, and the growing list of protected categories. This is a provocative suggestion, and, and I, think, I think it really leaves room for healthy debate both in the conservative and liberal movements, but I think it's the kind of debate we ought to be having to say that if we're not going to allow you to fire somebody or deplatform somebody because they're black or gay or Muslim or white or Christian or Jewish or Hindu or whatever, that you should not be able to fire them for being an outspoken conservative or an outspoken liberal either. Maybe one solution is really to trust the market and get rid of protected classes altogether. But if it's not, maybe we need to apply those standards even handedly, especially when, and this is you know, probably a longer rabbit hole that, I, that I'd be best served not to go into unless one of you want to in the Q&A, when I think actually some of that viewpoint-based discrimination was actually created by the invention of those protected categories in the first place, where they were well-intentioned parts of the Civil Rights Act when they were passed in 1964. But actually what happened over the years is they were interpreted really expansively to say that not only does it mean that you can't discriminate, but you also can't create a hostile workplace environment. Part of creating a hostile workplace environment means the expression of certain views can be hostile to those protected classes. And if you express those views, you're now contributing to actually creating a civil rights violation. So accidentally, I think what happened over six decades of jurisprudence, of expansive jurisprudence and expansive interpretations of these laws is that inadvertently, the people who wanted to bring a private sector together and rid it of racial and gender and, and, and other forms of discrimination accidentally created the conditions for the rampant viewpoint-based discrimination that we see today in the private sector while leaving viewpoint-based discrimination unprotected. And so, you know, I think these are the kinds of these are the kinds of problems I think that the conservative movement in particular needs to see with clear eyes, not just reciting slogans memorized in 1980 by song and verse, but by recognizing the ways in which the unique threats to liberty today present themselves through a combination of market forces and state forces that don't really fit the patterns served up to us 40 years ago. I'm not optimistic about many of those uh, solutions gaining momentum and 
and uh, legislative momentum behind them, say in Congress or in the, in the Senate or, or whatever. It's part of the reason why I uh, personally chose a path outside of policymaking to drive some of these changes. I'm doing what I can to be able to at least start these debates from the you know, pages of the Wall Street Journal on a given week or you know, television or writing some books. But at the end of the day, I actually grew much more optimistic about addressing some of these solutions through the market itself, which isn't constrained by, I think, some of the same shackles as the political process of being, one of the things about being one of 100 or one of, you know, 450 or whatever, is that, you know, I think it results in a lot of, um, in, in, both in a lot of constraints as well as a lot of theater that doesn't really result in an end result in a way that market solutions can. And I think that we live in a moment where we might be at the cusp of a, one of the defining economic opportunities of the next 10 years hiding in plain sight. And I think that economic opportunity is to serve the 100 plus million Americans who quietly see the same problems that I've just described for the last 20 minutes, but have been systematically excluded from the institutions who are supposed to serve them. Financial institutions, technology companies, even other nonprofit institutions like universities, 100 plus million Americans who have been systematically excluded and ignored, who, and this is the business opportunity part of it, happen to be some of the best customers that any business could wish for, some of the best clients that any business could wish for. Net savers, hard workers, people who don't lie on their you know, application for whatever, you know, financial insurance or, or lending or have investment power in their investment accounts, and I think that that might be one of those rare defining moments where we could see entire industries built on the back of serving that population. And I think that one of the industries I'm focused on is, is the asset management industry, because I think it's the one industry that's upstream of all of the others, right? It's the industry that directs the flow of capital to every other industry, from energy to technology to healthcare, you name it. And I think it's been one of the most politicized industries where a small group of market actors just for example, the top three passive asset managers in the United States, managing $22 trillion, more than the GDP of the United States, have adopted more or less a monolithic agenda that is not representative of the majority of the capital owners whose money they actually manage. It might be representative of that of CalPERS, but Comptroller Hager doesn't serve the citizens or the pensioners of California who CalPERS serves. He serves those in Texas. And many of the states across this country, if they have differing interests, that's okay. Diversity of choice in the market can actually serve those different interests. But you, a bifurcated market, I think, is in some ways inevitable when large institutions, especially financial institutions, insert themselves as vocal advocates for some of the people they serve. You can't be a vocal advocate for constituents with different interests. You can't represent the plaintiff and the defense in the same case. And it may be that as an asset manager, you can't represent California and Texas at the same time either. And I think that that's okay if it's part of the path that gets us to a depoliticized private sector. There's one of the things I'm worried about in the journey that I'm on actually, creating you know, Strive, we talked about it. It's a, it's a new asset manager. It's competing with those big three asset managers. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really just on the ground floor today. But one of the things I worried about in this journey was a concern that what it might do is create a permanently bifurcated market. You look at the market today, we have Republican pillows and Democratic beds. You know, <laughs> I'm not kidding. You know, my pillow and Casper or whatever else. You have, you have red coffee and blue coffee. I think that if we get to Republican baseball and Democratic baseball, that might be the beginning of the end of the American experiment as we know it, actually. And, 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 and I say it as a, in a joking manner, but, but I'm, I'm serious about the content of that. Because I think one of the roles of the private sector, one of the roles of American capitalism, one of the underappreciated roles of American capitalism isn't just to deliver products and services to people through an efficient allocation of capital that lifts people up, including people up from poverty. It does all of those things, and I'm a fan of it. But what it also does is it gives us an apolitical sanctuary, a sanctuary from the otherwise pervasive force of partisan politics, 
where people can actually come together, whether they are black or white, whether they are red or blue, gay or straight, man or woman, it does not matter. You can innovate together at a biotech company. You can transact together in the financial markets. You can work together to build something meaningful, regardless of the otherwise pervasive shackles of identity and partisan politics. And I think that is what we lose when the private sector becomes politicized. And while that might have worked as a trick for the defendants in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis, I think it has left us far more divided at the end of that journey, which leaves, at least on a positive side, an opportunity for a post ESG, post three letter acronymized version of capitalism, a post three letter future that doesn't come in three letters, but comes in the form of a few more around a topic that's near and dear to my heart. It's at the topic of my next book, a revival of a shared national identity based on the shared pursuit of excellence in the private sector and through every institution that defines who we are and what we do as Americans. And so I've got the notice for time. You know, the good news is I can I could probably go on for hours. I'll probably just close this up before we go to the Q&A with, with one final reflection is that I do think part of that part of that solution, that revival of American excellence, what it has the potential to do is to fill what I think is the real need at the heart of all of this. It's a generational need. My generation, millennials and younger, I think need it. But I think it's true. I'm convinced it's true of all generations of Americans. What we really need right now is something to fill our hunger for a cause. Okay. I think that we are all, as Americans, hungry for a cause, hungry for a sense of purpose and meaning and identity, but in a moment in our history, when the kinds of things that used to fill that hunger for purpose and meaning and identity, things like faith and patriotism or national identity or hard work or family or whatever those things might have been, they, they have receded in modern American life. And I think that is what allows poisonous identity politics to fill the void, poisonous quasi-religious fanaticism with respect to climate change driven agendas to scientism, which is different from science, whatever that agenda may be, it fills that void because even as we lose our belief in nation or in God or whatever we might have believed in, we don't lose our impulse to believe in something. And I think the right answer to this question has to be something other than just playing whack-a-mole with whatever poison fills the void, which is what I see much of the reactionary movement doing today but instead to fill that void with something more deep, more rich, more meaningful, that actually dilutes the poison to irrelevance. And to me, that's, that's the, that is the question of our moment. What does it mean to be American in the year 2022? I don't have all the answers. I think it revolves around that shared pursuit of excellence. I think it revolves around reviving that dream I talked about in the very beginning, the American dream. The idea that no matter who you are or where you came from or what your skin color is, or what your partisan affiliation is, you can do whatever you want and achieve whatever you want in this country with your own hard work, your own commitment, and your own dedication. That to me is the American dream. And guess what? You're also free to speak your mind at every step of the way. And I think if we can revive those common values over fractious group identity and religious fanaticism that we fail to recognize as actually modern religions, then I think nobody in the world is actually going to defeat us, be it a nation, a corporation or a virus. That to me is what true American exceptionalism is all about. And that's what I hope we can revive to defeat some of these cultural epidemics. So thanks a lot. And I'll, I'll look forward to taking your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I'm going to stay up here. I'll, I'll, I'll help moderate for you. All right. All right, so before we start questions, uh, one, if you are online, please get your questions in. They're coming here to this phone. I'm an Aggie, but I think I can do this and uh, check my phone at the same time. Uh, two, if you're in the audience, please wait for Clint over here to come to you with the microphone. And third, and most importantly, make sure it's an actual question. So put a question mark at the end of that. So we will start right over here um, in the, the tie right here. Thank you. Do you mind I make one comment and follow by question? <laughs> Man, already testing me. Yeah. Now, <laughs> make it quick. <laughs> yeah. So, um, a, a great talk, and you talk, and especially about immigrants coming here who have a greater appreciation for tra a tradition of traditional Americans of uh, beliefs in freedom, individualism, and ultimately opportunity to succeed. 
I've noticed there was a parallel even within the Chinese uh, community. So, uh, and especially how the wokeness is infecting at least the younger, the younger, the younger generation. So there were a couple, a couple, a few years ago, there's a huge controversy, another cancel culture controversy. There was this girl out in Utah who wore a, a Chinese traditional chipo, a Chinese traditional dress to, uh, to her high school prom. And then it caused a big uh, fuss online. All the people, many people, Act, liberal actors are calling for it to be like she was a racist, cultural appropriation, you know, the whole spiel. Um, there was there was a handful of like second generation Asians who who like who were used like the intersectional woke rhetoric. But what was remarkable is that everyone was like first generation Chinese people from the mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong. Didn't see, see all three section regions of the country united supporting that supporting that girl. So like so it's like it's like having like. Having that experience from our home country, like seeing what oppression, censorship was like, kind of gives like an immunity to like the to the woke uh, mob rule. So, I just, well, I just that that's my comment. Okay. <laughs> and my and my question is: so this girl segment of society who insists that cancel culture is a figment of your imagination, First Amendment only applies to the government. You, you're not being put in prison or being fined for what you're saying. This is this cartoon that says like cartoon like free speech just means like free speech like we have a right to show you the door if you think you're being a jerk so and that's what we're trying to hold you accountable for bad things you've done in the past so what do you say to that crowd who insists that cancel culture really isn't censorship yeah so i i i, I there was so much in your first comment that i want to briefly respond to it um and then and then I'll, I'll sort of respond to the second one briefly as well so Look, I think that much much of what we're discussing is actually not a uniquely even American issue. It's, I, I told you it's not, a, it's a transpartisan issue. It is also a transnational issue. It's, it's a unique feature of the moment we live in, in contemporary, not just American history, but world history. I think that in the American context, though, you can see it with especially high resolution in the experience of the first generation American, which I'm a member of. I, I don't know, I don't know which, what, you know, whether you're immigrant or first generation American. It's a very similar experience, right? Because I was born in 85, so sim similar experience. That is different than the actual second generation experience, the experience that my kids are gonna have in this country. So, so, so anyway, this is this really is the topic of my next book, but I think one of the things that happens when we lack an, a robust national identity, such as the one that I care about, a national identity built around the shared pursuit of excellence, one of the alternative identities that fills that void instead is the new victimhood identity. And one of the, one of the features of this victimhood identity is that it's, it's more infectious than COVID. <laughs> it, it really spreads at a, at a high rate of infectivity from what began as, I think, a progressive vision of victimhood, what, what you were referring to as woke victimhood. But I think if, if I'm sort of calling it even-handedly, I think that I worry about the way in which that's infected a lot of other neighboring communities. You know, we talk about Black Lives Matter and the BLM movement. One of the things I frequently say is we can't have a conversation in this country, an open conversation about what it means to lift up black lives in this country without openly talking about a cultural question of black victimhood it makes a lot of people uncomfortable because i'm not black but i think we got to be able to talk about it if we actually care about the question but we also i think have an epidemic of white victimhood culture in this country and i think we have an epidemic of second generation asian american victimhood in this country where kids are taught to claim the victimhood currency for themselves because that's what allows you to ultimately get ahead in some ways people respond to incentives and so i think you put your finger on a really important pulse that it's true in the first and second generation immigrant community. I, I see it all the time, but I think it's it's symptomatic of something that's going on nationally. Tipping point. Now, 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 to your second question about the um, about the free about about you know the the dogma that says you could be fired or shown the door for um, you know for saying something that was unorthodox or or contrary to the current orthodoxy. What do we think about that? Look, I, I'm not saying that all the answers here are going to be legal legal solutions. We do live in a country where if in a, we were truly operating in a free market, I think firms should be allowed to choose. Companies should be allowed to choose who they do or don't want to associate with if we're applying those standards even handily across the market. The reality though is, sometimes, sometimes I frequently joke about this, but it's a serious point. The free market cannot fix what it is not free to fix. And so if you're going to actually face a hostile workplace lawsuit for not firing somebody <laughs> who expressed a certain viewpoint that was deemed to be hostile, the free market can't fix that because no workplace can permit that employee to actually work there even when they're expressing a legitimate political perspective on their own time. So that's a long way of saying we can't have it both ways. We have to decide whether we trust the market or not. If we trust the market, let the market do its work. 
if we don't, then we need to apply those standards even handedly. And I think we haven't gotten to that place in the dialogue yet. That's a good question. All right, we'll do one online one and then we'll we'll come back to Clint. Um, so it, this question says, it feels like protesting with your dollars against big corporations that promote woke ideologies is fruitless. What do you think is the best way to fight back? I do think boycotts are mostly fruitless, um, you know, especially from a consumer products perspective. I think in the capital markets perspective is actually kind of interesting too, in terms of people are also waking up to the fact that their own money is being used to advance these ideologies in corporate America as shareholders, right? So, you know, I, you know give, give countless examples, but there are companies that have adopted racial equity audits like Apple, large shareholders like BlackRock, State Street and Vanguard all voted in favor of them against management's own recommendations at Apple similar things like scope three emissions caps at companies like Chevron. I could go on about the kinds of things that are happening with people's own money yeah. that I think there's two solutions here. And I'm focused on the investment piece of this because I think it's actually far more impactful and upstream than consumer behavior. But you know, on the investment piece of this, some people may say then, okay, then I don't want to own that company. I don't want to own Disney or Apple or you know, pick your company of choice. I'm gonna you know, divest from that company. I think that just creates an opportunity for someone else to then fill that void. And if it happens to be a successful company that generates a lot of cash flow, people miss out on that investment opportunity. People might miss out on the taste of Coca-Cola, yeah. which they previously missed. So I think the right solution is not the boycott divestment driven approach, but a pro engagement driven approach, actually exercising your voice by being the important stakeholder that you are, be it as a consumer or be it as a shareholder to show up and say that part of the problem isn't that these companies, you know, pick your asset manager of choice, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, whoever it is, isn't invested in Exxon or isn't invested in Apple. It's because they are invested yeah. in Exxon and Apple and slowly changing the purpose of what those corporations are. You too should be able to exercise your own voice as a stakeholder, be that as a shareholder, as a customer. And so I think that that's, that's, a, that's a philosophical question for the right way to engage. Is it through boycott or divestment or is it through engagement? I actually think that engagement is far more powerful. It is far more constructive. I think it's far more like described too, as I think that the hundred plus million Americans I described, I think the number is probably much bigger than that actually, but at least the hundred plus million adult Americans have the buying and investment power to actually drive change that they have not yet leveraged to drive that change. But I do think that's coming in the next 10 years. So don't boycott, engage instead. That'd be my summary. Amen, amen. All right, 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 right up here, sorry. I'm one of the uh, the victims of him earlier on the tennis court. <laughs> so you didn't win? The tennis? <laughs> Good, actually. Yeah, we, we, we mixed up the teams a little bit. Was, exactly. Yeah, great, we, we rotated it around. Um, appreciate it, and I'm a huge believer in the engagement model. Uh, the last <laughs> thing you want to do is is uh, I think uh, drift apart uh, because that doesn't solve any purposes. And so, uh, as a member of an asset manager uh, that has been mentioned here a few times. <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we are working very hard on, and I'm curious of your opinion and how we accomplish this. One of the things that we, our, my firm, doesn't want is to actually vote those proxies. We don't want the power in our hands. We want it in the people's hands. We want the people to vote. We want them to engage. We want them to make the decisions because it, it gets used against us all the time is like we're trying to wield our vote. We're trying to wield power. We don't want it. We're trying to set up technology to enable it to happen so other people can, so the real people, the real shareholders with their money can vote but they don't want to. And they don't do it when you send the proxies and they sit and they go in the garbage. And so they're looking for outsourcing. They're looking for ways to do that. One of those ways is to actually have companies. I talked to Andy Puzder about this, you know, have Andy create a, uh, a conservative voting mechanism instead of a, you know, what may be perceived as non-conservative voting mechanisms. But I'm curious from your perspective, how do we get over that hump? Because it, it is a divide between asset managers and the people and we, and, as an asset manager, BlackRock, we don't want it. We want the people to vote their proxy. So how, how, do, you, how do we get there? Yeah, so, so this, is, this is good for one reason, which is I think we need more open dialogue than we've had in operating in, in siloed environments. And I think that I am happy and I'm proud of BlackRock having somebody who's willing to ask a question in the open when I think part of the problem is that we've been hiding from debate. Let's have it in the open. I love that. That's part of engagement. So thank you. Uh, so look, I think that I think that without boring people to sleep too much on the proxy issue, I will be brief about it. I think there has to be a pragmatism to this too. It cannot be 
you know, excuse my language, but sort of hell with it, have it back, okay? And, and have people flooded with tens of thousands of decisions that they're going to have to make every spring in a three month cycle because all those people that had those money to invest won't have money to it left to invest if they if they don't have their jobs and have a full time job of trying to read through proxies and then mailing them in. And so I, I don't think it's a feasible solution. It's like the, it'll be like the Venezuelan election, right? <laughs> the opposition party doesn't show up. Great. I, I declare victory. I, I respectfully not not with respect to you, Michael, but with respect to, um, you know, I think the success of BlackRock over the last 12 years, I think was based in large part on its model of serving as a leader to advance certain behaviors and certain goals. I mean, take it from Larry Fink's mouth. At companies, you have to force behaviors. At BlackRock, we're forcing behaviors. Direct quote from the 2017 Deal Book Conference. I think that that's okay. It's, it's being a leader. It's doing what many clients want BlackRock to do. But there's a diversity of views in the marketplace. And I think it becomes really difficult to at once service as a good steward some of those views which represent many capital owners who may say that no i want to earn a lesser return if that's what comes to it but i still care about preparing the planet for inevitable climate change because what's the point of having investments if the planet is even going to survive the next century it's not my view but that's a, that's a that's a view and it's a legitimate view in the marketplace of ideas and someone who wants to invest that money accordingly deserves to have their capital invested by a steward who also advocates for that belief, and, and like it or not, I think that that's what that's what happened in the, in the in you know why what, why is it in Chevron's interest as a firm to adopt a scope three emissions cap, which says that Chevron as a company has to take responsibility for every Amazon Prime trucks delivery because their oil went to them. That's not in the interest of that company. BlackRock voted in favor of that proposal in 2019, so, so that's legitimate. For the people who want that view expressed, though, I'm not saying that that view doesn't belong in the capital market. But everyone deserves a steward that's who is also willing to stand for them. And I think that the model of pragmatically voting proxies, that's something that everyday individuals cannot take on. And it's a straw man to say that, OK, you don't like the way we're doing it, we'll give it back. I think we have to constructively instead, and it's a different, it's a different view. I mean, I, you know, I think these issues all deserve to be debated, but my, my opinion is that we need a robust marketplace that, that affords choice, that actually brings a diversity of perspectives to the table, to corporate America's boardrooms, that at least match the diversity of perspectives out there within a 100 mile radius of where we are, within a 10,000 mile radius of where we are as a country. And, and if there's a matching diversity of perspectives in a marketplace that offers that choice, we're in a good place. I don't think, I'm not in, this, I'm not in the eliminate ESG camp. I don't believe in the use of force legislatively or otherwise to eviscerate one set of viewpoints but i think you know, with due respect what's happened intentionally or not over the last 10 years is the 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 firms both in the asset management industry and i think in the technology industry that have aggregated so much capital and so much network effect driven power have adopted monolithic views that have been exercised through the force of their market power that betray the true diversity of ideas out in the marketplace. And maybe many of the leaders of those institutions, I mean, you're not the leader of, of that of one of any of the institution you work at, but many of the leaders of those institutions may look back and say, what have I done? And, and I didn't ever want to be in this position of power. I don't, I can't speak for them, but that is the reality that obtains today. And I think that in some ways it's not their job to solve it. Part of the job to solve it is for other market actors to bring that diversity of choice and diversity of voice to the table. And I think that that's going to require market actors at every level of the chain. I mean, a state treasurer is not just our state regulator. A state treasurer is a market participant too. And I think that a, a bifurcation in the market may be inevitable in the near term to get to a place where we actually have true competition in the marketplace of ideas. But I love that we can have this conversation in the open, and I think our country will be a better place if we're able to air these debates in the open and diverse views, even amongst competing ideas and even competing firms. I think it's great. Amen, amen. All right, time for one more question. Obviously, if you don't get a chance to ask it, uh, Vivek will be outside, but last one goes right here to Matt. You talked, Vivek, about um, capital markets being upstream from consumer boycotts in terms of the effect 
That word upstream made me think of the Daniel Patrick Moynihan quote about politics being downstream from culture. We haven't talked as much about culture tonight. I know that may not be the folks of the last book or the next book, but it sure looks to me as though the culture is a huge part of the problem here, that the culture is effectively um, uh, producing right uh, millions of new adherents to this new religion. Uh, if you look at the major institutions in our country, the right or the center right has lost any ability to control, you know, large sectors of, of these cultural institutions. Uh, clearly, they're making a push on the military. We've lost higher ed. We've lost Hollywood, if we ever had it. There's a number of others you could go to. How do we begin to, 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 to combat that? Obviously, we have to compete. We have to create our own institutions. We have to find major funders. Um, the left is so much stronger, has such an advance, um, uh, kind of a head start on us in those areas. I just wonder if, if we're pumping out college graduates, 90% of whom believe in this stuff, don't even want to hear opposing viewpoints. Viewpoints aren't even allowed on campus unless it's a safe space. I just wonder, what do we do about that? Yeah, so the, the only reason I don't talk explicitly about culture in its own terms, even though I think it's the most important conversation that, that's lurking beneath all of this, is that changing the culture is easy to talk about. What does that mean in terms of a mechanism of changing the culture? I think culture is the product of an educational system, of a marketplace, of policies, of higher institutions, of higher learning, all of which influence this thing that, we're, that we call culture that's left at the end of it. And so that doesn't mean it's not important. It means that it's just very hard to say, I'm going to change culture directly instead of actually looking at what the upstream inputs to that culture are. I'm gonna give you a rules of the road answer that's not uh, framed in right or left particular terms. I don't disagree with a lot of what you said, but. Um, personally, but I think it may be more important to even just talk about what are the principles for getting to a more healthy, robust culture that avoids being the vacuum, the black hole that allows a lot of the poisonous problems we've discussed to fill that void. I think that, I think that all sides of, a, of, of this political and cultural debate need to do a better job of offering an affirmative view, an affirmative vision of national identity, of shared American identity. What does that mean? and be able to accept that there are competing views that ought to compete in that marketplace of ideas. In the educational system, I see the same thing in terms of disproportionate discussions about what ought not be taught in a given school with insufficient attention paid to what ought to actually be taught in that school. Even in the, even in the anti-ESG movement, and this is something I'm very close to. I mean, this is what we don't want advanced as an agenda in corporate America. Well, what ought to be the agenda that companies ought to advance? I personally believe it's to pursue product excellence over politics. Maybe somebody else thinks it's a different agenda. But I think the rules of the road answer is that I think conservatives and liberals both have room to get better, conservatives especially, about offering an affirmative vision rather than just a deconstructionist critical game of whack-a-mole of, you know, vi of viewing this as sort of a tug of war rather than a menu where we put the item on the menu that we think more people are going to find more persuasive to order for themselves. And I think that gets us to a place where we're then debating those competing ideas in the marketplace of ideas, in the market, in our politics, that I think itself, that process of debate is the American culture, I think, at the end of the day. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's my rules of the road answer rather than a, you know, how one side of the you know, political spectrum beats the other kind of side of the answer. But, um, you know, hopefully that's helpful. So anyway, right. thanks a lot. I, uh, I appreciate I'm, it. We're going to end with one last question of personal privilege that we, we ask a lot here, but you touched on this a little bit, and I think it kind of gets into, we, we've heard several reasons of what to do on culture and, and what needs to happen in the, in the market. But I want to hear from you, and I think our audience would love to hear from you. Why are you optimistic about where we're going? Yeah. Look, at, at the end of the day, um, I'm optimistic because history, American history teaches us to be optimistic, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I think that the American Revolution was fought under daring circumstances, odds of success that no one would have predicted. Reuniting country after the Civil War, that was daring odds that we faced at every, every point along that way. Even the na crisis of national identity much more recently in the 1970s appeared to be exactly, bear a lot of similarities to the moment we're in. So I think American, teach, American history teaches us to be optimistic. But the reason I'm optimistic is I think that even a lot of the cultural challenges we face start from a, start from a very healthy human spirit that is 
concerned with how do we actually make the world better, right? Even the, even the woke movement that I, you know, uh, you know, am quite critical of in, in the book that I wrote starts with a premise of being alert to historical injustices that we ought to fix, at least in the pre in the post money corrupted version of it. It starts from an authentic place of asking ourselves, how do we actually make a positive contribution towards creating a better nation? And I think that as long as we're able to say, I am optimistic if we're able to separate the cynical forces that then prey on those on those attitudes, you know, a generation that wants to do good, but have companies that then prey on that by selling them virtue signaling and morality, teaching them that the way you satisfy your moral hunger is by going to Ben and Jerry's and ordering a cup of ice cream with some sprinkles of morality on the top. Kind of like a you know Virginia Slim's manufacturer might have preyed on the body image insecurities of a teenage girl in the 1990s. As long as we're able to separate the cynical forces out of it, then I'm optimistic that actually we're going to be able to work it out amongst ourselves as mm -hmm. citizens by allowing our well-intentioned differences of opinion to work themselves out in the civic spheres of our lives, in the civic institutions of our lives, in places like nonprofit institutions, to educational institutions, to our political process. We're going to be just fine working that out as citizens as we always have for 250 plus years in this country, as long as we're able to separate the, the cynical forces that lurk behind the scene. And that's sort of the heart of the, now none of you even have to take a copy of the book. The, 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 the view, the vision of the book is separate capitalism from democracy. Too much discussion about separation of church from state without enough about separating capitalism from democracy. They're both part of American identity. 1776 was, not just the year of the Declaration of Independence, it was also the year of the wealth of nations, both capitalism and democracy, both individualism and unity, both the American dream and the First Amendment, both of those are at the heart of true untarnished American identity. Mm -hmm. And if we're able to get the cynical, uh, I would say financial forces out of preying on those insecurities, we're gonna be able as a people to work them out just fine amongst ourselves as citizens. Amen. So, Ladies and gentlemen, Vivek Ramasamy. Thank you. All right. Vivek will be outside signing books. There's 20 of them. If you need a 21st, let me know. I'll give you mine. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's fantastic. Thanks.